ringing? Can you? Yeah? I don't know what you can do about that. Okay, that's a little bit. Can you hear me okay? All right, here we go. So, the title of this message is Mistaken Identity 2. We had Mistaken Identity number 1 right before Mother's Day, but Mother's Day came in there, so we had a little break, okay? This is part 2 of that series uh, that I began just before Mother's Day, and it deals with the importance of knowing who you are now that you belong to the family of God. It's very important to know who you are. If you had an accident, just imagine this. If you had an accident and you woke up in a hospital with amnesia, completely uncertain of your true identity, then you would find yourself completely at the mercy of those around you to help you to find out who you really were, wouldn't you? You know, you'd say, do you know my name? Do you know who I am? Does anybody recognize me? You'd be at the mercy of others to tell you who you were. So really, uh, let's suppose that you were the heir to a great fortune, but you've lost your memory. And you're a member of a royal family, but those caring for you informed you that you were really just a homeless, penniless beggar. Then eventually your attitudes, your actions would become the role that you were cast in. You would begin to act like the person they told you that you are. You'd begin to act like, well, I'm penniless, so I can't do much for myself. Well, I'm a beggar, so I depend on others. Those are the kind of attitudes you would take on because somebody told you that's who you were, even if you were in a royal family, even if you were an heir to a great fortune. You'd probably act like someone, uh, uh, you know, who had little value in your life and was of little impact on this earth. That's the person you would act out because that's who they told you that you were and you didn't know any better. Now, on the other hand, if you were a penniless beggar and you had the amnesia, And they told you, you're the son of a king. You're an heir to a great fortune. You have great power and authority over nations. If they told you this, then you would probably act like someone who had great importance. Someone who had great value. Somebody who expected a certain amount of respect from other people. Someone who was confident that their life was important. That's who you would act like because somebody told you that's who you were. So what's the difference? You will adapt your lifestyle to appropriately reflect the person that you believe yourself to be. Whatever you believe about yourself, you're going to live that out. If you believe you're a complete loser in every realm of life, you're going to act like that. This is where true identity becomes very, very important. This is the thing that will determine how you live your life on this earth from this day forward. This matter is so crucial to your walking in power and victory that it's one of the main points of attack that your enemy, the devil, will attempt to assault you in. If you've received Jesus Christ into your heart to be your Lord and Savior, if you've asked him to forgive you for all of your sins and live his life through you, then you have died and been born again. You see, we talk about the born again life. We talk about you must be born again. And we sometimes forget somebody died when that person was born again. You see, we remember that, yes, we got born again, so now there's two of us, the old us and the new us. We forget that that first person died, and we carry on the identity of the first person. And we try to fix up the first person to look like this new person should look. We try to take this old wreck of a car and polish the scratches out of it as much as we can and make it look like a new car. But the Lord said, no, I've done away with the old, and I've given you brand new. It's not the same thing as it was once before. Who died? The old you died. The defeated pauper, the beggar, the powerless slave to sin, the fallen, the defeated, the unworthy, the unholy, the doomed person, the lost person, that first person that was born into this fallen world. They died. They're dead. That's what the Bible says. So who was born? A free man was born. A righteous man was born. A powerful son or daughter of the greatest king who rules the greatest kingdom of all was born. That's who was born. That's your new identity. Your old identity has no bearing on your new identity. That old person has died. A new person has been born. Who was born? You are a royal priest of the Most High God. You you are a royal priest. Not somebody else, you. You are a king in the kingdom of God. Bible says that. You're kings and priests unto God. That's what it says. 
You're an invincible soldier in the army of light. The kingdom of darkness is subject to your every command, and the devil and all his demons have been put under your feet. All of them. You have all the riches of heaven in Christ Jesus at your disposal. And you will live forever, and you are presently seated with Christ in heavenly places. That's the new you. That's the real identity. The devil doesn't want you to know that. The devil wants you to remember your old identity. He wants you to say, ah, that's still me. That's who I am. And that's who I'm stuck with. But that's not what Christ says. This is all about the good news that we need to realize that the good news about the fact we've been born again, that the good news that we are no longer paupers, we're no longer strangers in the kingdom of God, we're no longer the outcasts, we're no longer the fallen, but that we are the children of the king, that good news is something that we need to embrace. It's something we need to recognize. It's not about someone else, it's about you. Here's a proof of what I'm saying. You were born in sin, that we know. Psalms 51.5 says, Surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. You might say, but how is a little baby sinful from the time the mother conceived? Because everybody that is born of a woman after the fall of man is born with a sinful nature. Every one of them is born with a sinful nature. That's just the way it is. If you're born of the flesh, you're born with a sinful nature in the beginning. Romans 3.23 says this, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Everybody. You were born a slave. That's the way you were born the first time. John 8.34, Jesus replied, Very truly, I tell you, everyone who sins is a slave to sin. But when you were born, you were born a slave to sin. So you were born a slave. You were born into darkness and under the power of the prince of darkness, Satan, or the devil. Look at Ephesians 2, 1 through 3. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sin in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving wrath. We were by nature those people who were of the fallen nature who followed after the prince of darkness and did his ways, but not God's ways. That's the way it was. That was a bummer of an identity. That's the identity you don't want. The fallen person. The person who is living after the fallen nature. The person who is unholy, who is who is unrighteous. The person who is unworthy in every sense of the word. The person who has no power in their own life, but they are under the power of the adversary. That's who you were. But that's your old identity. Here's your new identity. Romans 6, 1 through 7. What shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? By no means. We are those who have died to sin. See that? Somebody died. Can we live it in it any longer? Or don't you know? You see, some people forget stuff. Don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism in death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. A new life. For if we have been united with him in death like his, we will also be united with him in the resurrection like his. For we know, this is it, we know, not we wonder, not we guess at it, not we theorize, we know that our old self was crucified with him. Our old self died on the cross. So that the body ruled by sin might be done away with. It's done away with. That we should no longer be slaves to sin. No longer slaves. Because anyone who has died has been set free from sin. Now even in the days of slavery, it's quite obvious. The master has power over that slave. Till they die, then what can he do? No power. When you died, the old man died. The devil lost his power over you. Completely. And then Christ raised you up with him as a new creation. Our new identity is not that of a slave, but it's that of a free man. 2 Corinthians 5, 15 through 21. And he died for all those who live, should no, that should no, should no longer live for themselves, but live for him who died for them and was raised again. 
So from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view, though we once regarded Christ in this way. We do so no longer. Therefore, listen to this. If anyone is in Christ, they're a new creation. The old has gone and the new is here. The old is gone. The new is here. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sin against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become, this is what you become, can you believe this? So that we might become the righteousness of God in Christ. You're the righteousness of God? How is that possible? I don't feel like that. It's not about you. It's about Christ. It's about Christ in you. It's about what he's done for you. It's not what you've done. It's what he's done for you. It's what he's done in you. He made you what you are in this new creation. And you can't deny what he's done. Okay? When he says you are a new creation, then you are. When he says that you're no longer a slave to sin, then you're no longer a slave to sin. When he says you're the righteousness of God, then you are. When he says you're the ambassadors of Christ, then you are. Because you got to decide who you're going to believe. Who are you going to believe? You're going to believe God or the devil? Who are you going to believe? The devil, he says stuff that kind of rings more true sometimes to us. Like, well, yeah, I really am kind of a bad person. Yeah, I really am this. He wants, he wants you to be stuck in that old identity. He doesn't want you to live in the new identity. Because if you know who you really are, it'll change your behavior. It'll change how you look at things. It'll change your perspective on life. Because you're going to live a life that matches the script you've been given of who you think you are, the role you think you have. We were, and it's were, if you've accepted Christ, were unrighteous beggars. That's what we were. We were separated from God. But when we were born again, we became new creations. We became new men and women. We became the righteousness of God in Christ. All of that old man has passed away. And our life is made completely new. Completely new. Now, I'm saying this to people who know these words are in the Bible, but some of us, there's something inside us that I want to buy that, but I'm not sure I can buy that. That's the problem right there. You have to decide what you're going to believe. You have to decide, will I believe the truth even if I don't feel it right now? Or will I just believe what I feel? Well, you know, we don't walk by the feelings here. We don't walk by sight. We walk by faith. We don't believe what the devil says, even if it's a very convincing argument. We believe what God says, even if we don't see it. Because God is true and the devil's a liar, and that's always been the way it is. It's never going to change. Okay? We are not just loyal subjects, loyal subjects in the kingdom of heaven, but we're actually sons and daughters of the king. Amen. See that? We are heirs of the riches of heaven. We are priests in the temple of the Most High God. You are. 1 Peter 2.9 says it. Here's what it says. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a royal priesthood, royal priesthood, not just a priesthood, a royal priesthood. You're from a kingly family and you're a priest, a holy nation, God's special possession that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness. You're not in darkness anymore into his wonderful light. That's who you are. But I don't feel it. Stop feeling it. Start believing it. You will live out what you believe. 1 Peter, or no, 1 John 3, 1. See what great love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called, guess what? The children of God. And that is what we are. That's what we are. You feel it or not? That's what you are. The reason the world does not know us is he didn't know, didn't know him either. We are not paupers. We're not beggars. We're heirs to the greatest kingdom of all. Romans 8, 17. Now, if we are children, then we are heirs. Heirs of God and co-heirs heirs with Christ, if indeed we share in his sufferings, in order that we may also share in his glory. Now, this says co-heirs with Christ. I want to tell you something. This is the thing. If you're an heir to a fortune, this is an important thing. Someone has, has, has put you in their will for a fortune. You don't get the fortune until they die. Well, guess what? Jesus died already. So it's yours now. Amen. You're a co-heir now. Okay. So let's talk about this part of the scripture that everybody likes to skip over. That we're co-heirs with Christ if we share in his sufferings. Oh, let's just put that one under the carpet. 
I'm not talking about that suffering part. I don't want to talk about that suffering part. I'm going to give you a different perspective on the suffering part. Hopefully, that'll make it more palatable to you. So let's talk about the suffering part for a moment. That part doesn't sound quite cheery, does it? Oh, I don't want the sufferings. I just want the stuff, not the sufferings. Many people like to leave that part out, but others like to rub it in. You're going to have to really suffer in this life for Christ. But what does it really mean? You are a son and you are a daughter of God. That's for sure. God is a spirit. Did you know that? God's a spirit? That's what the Bible says. God is spirit. He's not flesh. Did you know that? Your sonship, your daughtership, if that's a word, being a child of God, refers to the fact you are the child of God who's a spirit. We're talking about spiritually, you're a child of God. Spiritually, you're a child of God. Your spirit has been born again, not your flesh, has it? That comes later. Right now, your spirit has been born again. Your spirit has been born into the family of God. Your spirit is the child of God, not your flesh. Okay? Now follow with me for a minute here. God is a spirit, not flesh, so your sonship refers to your spirit being a member of the family of God. Your flesh in its present state is still subject to certain things as we live on this earth. It's still subject to certain things. It is subject to temptation for one thing, still. Do you know that? The devil can't make you do anything just as he couldn't make Eve eat of the fruit. But he certainly could tempt her, couldn't he? She had to make the choice, but he was allowed to tempt her. Well, guess what? You live in the flesh, and yes, you've been born again, and you have the Spirit of God in you, and you're a child of God, but your flesh is still here the way it was in the sense that it can be tempted. Okay? You know that. Your suffering on this earth, this is the point about suffering, does not necessarily, not necessarily, it can, but it doesn't necessarily have anything to do with martyrdom or poverty or any of that in this particular context. But this is what it does mean. As long as you're in this mortal body, you will be denying the flesh some of the things that it wants. Your flesh will suffer because your flesh will say, but I want this. And you'll say, you can't have it. Guess what? You're going to suffer in the flesh. Not in the spirit, in the flesh. Your flesh wants to do what satisfies its carnal desires. Your spirit is ruling over the flesh now. The flesh will have to suffer from not getting its way often. Your flesh is like an unruly and a stubborn child who wants to eat two pounds of chocolate for dinner. And your spirit is the apparent parent saying, we're not going to do that. It's not good for you. The flesh, oh, the flesh is so, oh, you hate me. You're being so mean to me. Oh, I'm making me suffer because I can't do what I want to do. That's the way the flesh is. So if you want to reign with Christ, guess what? Your flesh is going to have to be put under subjection. And it's going to have to suffer a little bit. It's not suffering in the sense of something really horrible. It's suffering in the sense that it doesn't get its way. But that's okay, isn't it? Your flesh is no different from a child that doesn't get its way when you say no to it. It suffers. It pouts. It wishes it had its way. It doesn't understand why you're so unfair. Romans 13, 13 through 14 says this. Let us behave decently as in the daytime, not carousing and dr- in drunkenness, not in sexual immor- immorality and debauchery, not in dissension and jealousy. Now listen to this. But put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh. Don't let the flesh have its way. You see? Don't let the flesh have its way. If you're going to live a godly life, you're going to have to say no to the flesh sometimes, aren't you? The flesh is going to have to suffer from not getting its way anymore. Because Christ rules in you now. Titus 2, 11 through 12. For the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. It teaches us to say no. Listen to this. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions. And to live self-controlled, uprightly, and godly in this present age. Well, the Spirit of God teaches us to say no to ungodly passions. You're still going to have those passions because you have flesh right now. You're still walking around a flesh body. It's still going to have certain desires. And you're going to have to say no. And it's going to suffer. But you're going to be all right. You're going to be fine. Because as the flesh suffers, the spirit strengthens. And the spirit is built up. Now that your spirit is alive, the desires of the flesh must be put to death. Romans 8, 13. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the spirit you put to death the deeds of the flesh, you will live. Nothing likes to be put to death on the altar. Nothing. Nothing likes to be put to death, and that's especially true about your flesh. It doesn't want to be put to death either. Romans 12.1 says this, Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, 
In the view of God's mercy, listen to this, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices. Oh, they don't want to do that, do they? Holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Now let's move forward from this point and let's talk about something that many Christians have missed concerning their new identity. And this is the reason why so many are walking in a powerless, defeated, beggarly, bitter life situation even after they get saved. We will take a look now at the story of the prodigal son. Does everybody here know the prodigal son story? Most of us do. Most of us know the story, but I want to focus our attention on somebody else. I don't want to focus on the prodigal. I don't want to focus on the wayward son. And I don't even want to focus on the father. I want to focus on that obedient son that stayed home. Do you remember that? The older son, he didn't leave. He stayed home with the father. In this parable, there are two sons and there's a wealthy father. One son is responsible. He's hardworking. He's loyal. The other is selfish and lazy and he's a goof off. The selfish son went to his father. This is the younger son. And he basically said, I don't want to wait till you're dead before I get my inheritance. Give it to me right now. I want to go and be my own man, make my own decisions, and live my own life. So just give me the money. That's the way he was. The father gave him his inheritance. And the son went off and lived like the devil in a place that sounds something like Las Vegas, right? That responsible son, however, stayed home with the father. Eventually, this younger son used up all of his money, and he found no kindness given to him by his worldly friends. So being penniless and a pauper, he said to himself, I will go back to my father's house, and at least I can probably get a job as a hired hand on the ranch, you know? Maybe he'll give me a job at least. At least I'll have something to do and make a little money. So the son returned, and when the father saw him coming home, the father ran to him when he saw him from far off, and he said to the servants, put a fine robe on him, Put shoes on his bare feet, put a gold ring on his finger, and prepare a feast. Kill the fattest calf, and let us have a party. You remember all that stuff. When the responsible son saw the father's lavish mercy upon this wayward brother, he became bitter. He became jealous. And this is where we're going to pick up on the story in Luke 15, 25 through 31. It says, meanwhile, the older son was in the field. He's back working. When he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. Somebody's having a party. So he called one of the servants and asked him, what's going on? Your brother has come home, he replied, and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has, uh, has him back safe and sound. The older brother became angry and refused to go in. So the father went out and pleaded with him. But he answered his father, look, all these years I've been slaving for you and, you've, and never disobeyed your orders. Yet you never gave me even a young goat so I would celebrate my, with my friends. But when this son of yours who squandered your property with prostitutes comes home, you kill the fattened calf for him. You see the bitterness here? My son, the father said, you are always with me and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad because this, bro- this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and now he's found. You know that part of the story, right? But I want to bring your full attention on something very important found in verse 31. My son, the father said, you are always with me and everything I have is yours. That's very key to what we're talking about. What does this mean? This is of the utmost importance. It is not possible for you to be thankful for what you are not aware of having. Do you know that? If you don't know you have something that it hasn't been, you don't know it's been given to you, then you're not going to be thankful for it, are you? You know, if God's give, if somebody's given you an inheritance, there's, there's a million dollar bank account with your name on it, and you never know about it, you're not going to go, thank you, Lord, for that million dollars, because you don't even know it exists, right? You have to know that you have it before you can be thankful for it. Does that make sense? Okay, you get what I'm saying, all right? If there was a million dollars, like I said, with your name on it, And nobody told you that it was there. You wouldn't be saying, Lord, I thank you so much for that million dollars. It's going to provide for my family, my friends. I'm so glad. You're not saying that if you don't even know you have it. In fact, you might be looking at your neighbor who's a sinner. And you might be saying, I don't get it, Lord. How come he always seems to get blessed and I get nothing? That might be your attitude. The prodigal brother had something. He had something. It was his, but he didn't realize it. And there's the problem. Because he never realized it, he never got the opportunity to enjoy it. Because you can't enjoy what you don't even think you have. You have to know you have it before you can enjoy it. 
It's hard to enjoy your salvation when you don't believe you're saved, isn't it? It's hard to enjoy the love of God when you've never received the love of God. You have to realize he's given it. Because he never realized it, this prodigal brother, he never had the opportunity to enjoy it. He was jealous that his brother was thrown a party and got to have the fatted calf and was bitter at his father for not throwing him a party like that. But the father said something that was very revealing. He said this, you are always with me and, this is it, everything I have is yours. He didn't know it was his, but the father knew it. The father said, I've given you everything. It's all yours, but you don't think you have it. You're jealous about your brother having a fatted calf. Don't you realize all these cows here, they're all yours. All this stuff is yours. You can throw a party anytime you want because it's yours, but you think you don't have it. You think you haven't received anything. That's the problem with many Christians. They don't know what they've been given. You don't know what you've received. And when you don't realize what you've been received, you can't be thankful for it. So you walk along in bitterness. My life sucks. I'm still a penniless pauper. I still don't have this. I still don't have that. Blah, blah, blah. You don't realize God has given you all the riches in Christ Jesus. All of them. The devil cannot take from you what God has given you. But I'll tell you what he can do. The next best thing. He can hide it from you. He can hide your eyes from seeing what God's given you. He can make you not realize what God's given you. And when you don't realize what God's given you, you start looking at others and you start getting jealous. How come they got all that and I got nothing? Because you don't realize what you've got. You're sitting on a gold mine here. God has given you all the riches of heaven. But if you don't know it, you're not going to be thankful. You're going to be bitter. If you don't realize what you have, you not only will be unthankful, you will not access it, you will not utilize it because you don't think you even have it. Does that make sense? God cannot give to you what he's already given to you. Amen. He's already given you power over the enemy, whether you believe it or not. Luke ten nineteen says this, I have given you authority to trample on snakes, scorpions, and to overcome all the power of the enemy. And nothing will harm you. He's already given you that. He's already given you every spiritual blessing, whether you know it or not. Praise, Ephesians 1, 3. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realm with every spiritual blessing in Christ. Everyone. He's already given us everything we will ever need to live this life to its fullest and do so in a godly way. 2 Peter 1, 3. According as his divine power hath given unto us, he's already done, hath given to us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him that called us to his glory and virtue. The problem with most Christians isn't that they don't believe in God, it's that they don't believe God. They believe in God, they just don't believe what he said about him. They don't believe his report about him. They don't believe when he said, I've given you all this stuff. They say, well, I don't see it. I believe in you, you're real, but I don't believe what you're saying. See, I believe in you, but I don't believe you. They believe the devil over God. You know, he, they say, I believe in you that you're God, but the devil's been telling me I don't have this stuff, so I feel like I don't have it too. We have to stop believing what the devil says. Start believing what God says. You cannot be thankful for what you don't think you have. You cannot utilize for what you don't think you have. You have to rec- recognize what you do have. You have to recognize that God has given you everything that you need. You see, uh, if you're praying for, like a lot of people, they're praying for God somewhere to shower us down the glory from heaven that latter rain shout give us your spirit pour it out you know we've been praying for a revival come on you realize the revival is in you you just need to stir it up you realize the holy spirit doesn't need to come from anywhere he's in you you just need to let him out you got to realize what you have the devil says you're a defeated powerless person but god says you're more than a conqueror the devil says you're a nothing and a nobody but god says you are sons and daughters of the most high god the devil says you lack And God isn't listening to your prayers. But God says you've been given all things and your heavenly father gives good gifts to those who ask. The devil says you're doomed to die of an incurable sickness. But the word of God says by his stripes you were healed. The devil says you aren't good enough to go before God and ask anything of him. And God says come boldly to the throne of grace that you may obtain mercy and find grace in time of need. You will live out the role of who you believe that you are. You will have to believe the report of someone as to who you really are. And either that report is a report that God gave of you or the devil. That decision is yours. And based on that decision, your life will reflect who you believe you are. We have to know who we are in Christ. 
Once you begin to know who you are in Christ, you will begin to reflect that in your life. You'll begin to walk in power. You'll begin to walk in faith. You'll begin to walk in victory because you have it all anyway. We just have to start believing it. All right, I want to ask the question, is there anybody here today who has not received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Because if you have not, this is the day you need to do this. This is the day to be born again, to receive a brand new life, to be set free from the slavery of sin. Now, you all look like Christians, but who knows? Anybody, if you're here, raise your hand, and we'll pray with you. All right, all right. Let's bow our heads for a moment of prayer. Father, in Jesus' name, we ask that you seal these words to our heart, Lord. That we will take notice of these words, Lord. That we will ponder these words in our heart. That we will meditate on these words and we will make them part of us. In Jesus' name. Let these words have power now, Lord, in Jesus' name in our lives. To change us and to alter, alter the way we see ourselves and the way we see you. We thank you for what you've given us. We rejoice in it. And we walk in the power of it. In Jesus' name, we thank you, Father. Amen. God bless you. Hope to see you tomorrow night. Amen.